of our time. On the top of the page is different ways that you can contact me. And I emphasize this because it's important that you get help when you need to get help. All right. So if you're having a problem, if there's something you don't understand, ask about it. Um, sometimes students let it go too far before they ask. Um, and they, they dig themselves a hole, and it's hard to get out of that hole. Um, if you take the time uh, to, to ask the question, though, um, it, uh, it, you know, it, it'll go much better for everyone. And I, I try to give you multiple methods so that there's no reason why you, can't ask, you, why you don't have time to ask the question uh, if you want to. You can ask the question certainly in class. You can also ask the question in lab if you want. Um, I don't have my office hours defined yet, but when I have my office hours defined, there'll be that time that you can ask questions. Uh, you can come to my office and ask me questions. Um, you can email me through Canvas or through my regular email. There's discussion forums online. Um, if needed, I can Skype with you uh, if you can't make it in during office hours. And if all else fails, contact me and we'll figure out something else. Maybe if your work schedule or whatever prohibits you from getting here during office hours and you have more questions than can be answered during the class or the lab, we'll figure something out. Uh, I make every effort to provide a lot of ways to get a hold of me and um, you know, but you have to meet me halfway. Um, it's difficult for me to tell where, when people are confused sometimes. Um, and therefore, you have to let me know if you're having questions. Um, there's an old adage that teachers say that if one person in the class has a question, there's a good chance that other people in the class have the same question. So keep that in mind. If there's something that's puzzling, maybe other people are, are puzzled, puzzled by it as well. So feel free to ask. At worst, what I'll say is if it's something that maybe is specific to you, like something specific to a program you're working on or whatever, I can, uh, you know, we can talk about it during lab. All right, so, but, but again, by all means, ask. And here's a bunch of different ways that you can contact me. The so course description and outcomes, that really is sort of a focus of where, uh, where we, you know, where we are um, in this class and what our goals are. Uh, instructor approach, uh, the key sentence here, this is your class. It doesn't do me any good to cover the material if people aren't getting it. And therefore, I need that feedback from you so that I can understand how well uh, you're absorbing the material and what you have questions with and what you have problems with. Um, that's all I'll say about that. College policies, I have a whole list of policies. Um, that are, are college policies, not mine. You should read through them, and you can read about them in the handbook. Instructor policies, as far as late work goes, I'm pretty flexible about it, provided that I know that you are making a diligent effort. So uh, every semester, I get a few students that just literally disappear and then come back weeks, months later, and want to turn in lab one. Well, I don't feel bad deducting folks like that a few points, because, hey, you know, I mean, how am I supposed to know what's going on? If there's something that's going on where you're ill, you have a family emergency, whatever, I don't need to know the details, any more details than you're willing to divulge. So you can just tell me, look, I'm, I'm in a rough patch, and this homework assignment's going to be late, or whatever. And, and that's fine. Um, but again, I want to hear something from you. I want to see questions from you in lab or in class or via email and so on. If I'm convinced that you're diligently working on something, then if I get it in a day after it's due or two days after it's due, I'm not going to really care all that much. All right? Uh, my, my, my goals are, are centered around where you will be when you leave this class. All right? Uh, and therefore, I want to make sure you, you have the material learned when you leave this class. So if you learn something a couple days late, um, I'm not really concerned about it. There is sort of a, uh, uh, some cautionary words, though is first of all, you know, my patience isn't limited. Because at the end of the semester, you have to have everything in. All right? And if you are continually behind on the assignments, that ought to be a warning sign to you that something needs to change. Maybe you need to spend some extra time on it. Maybe you need to talk with me. Um, any number of possibilities it could be. But the bottom line is, is if you're late once because you had the flu and couldn't work on something, no big deal. If you tend to be late on every assignment and you get, or you're beginning to get later and later and later, then that's a sign that something needs to change and you should talk to me. So 
I try to be flexible while still, um, you know, still trying to, to holding you responsible to getting the work done. And you can't see that up on the screen. That happens periodically. There's ever something on the screen, and I'm talking about something on the screen, and you don't see it. Feel free to yell out. All right. I haven't showed anything really too much. Uh, I showed the modules for this class, where there's a course information one, and there's a one for each week, and we looked at the syllabus, where there's introductory material, different ways of contacting me. Um, and so on. The phone, by the way, is probably the worst way to contact me because uh, I only answer it when I'm in my office, sometimes not even then if I'm in the middle of something, um, and I only check my voicemail when I'm on campus. So you're much better off emailing me than voicemail. Here's the descriptions I talked about, instructor approach and so on, and we're up to the late policy. There'll be approximately 13 assignments worth five points each, and that'll be 65 points. There'll be 15 points on the midterm and 20 on the final. That's a total of 100 points. Um, it will mostly be an assignment a week. That could change. There could be like a larger assignment that covers two weeks in some cases. Um, if for whatever reason we don't get to the 65 points, I prorate it. Or if we were to go a little over, I, I prorate it. I figure it out. So, uh, the, the midterm and the final are always worth the 15 and the 20, and then the homework assignments are, are always worth 65. So if there's more or less than 65 points, I prorate it so that it comes out to be 65. And then there's a standard A, B, C, D, and so on. Um, here's a schedule that will follow. And that's about it as far as the, the housekeeping for this class goes. Any questions? I don't know why I went over it so much quicker today, or this afternoon, than I did this morning. This morning, I don't know if, there was, if my canvas for that class was more interesting or, or what. There's more stuff in it. I don't know. All right. Anyhow, one of the things uh, I, I, I assume, although I have not tested it, so this might be an invalid assumption, but I assume that the, the computers in our lab are configured to do Java. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll find out that today, won't we? Um, if they're not, then we can deal with it in lab and we'll talk about it. But you might have a, uh, you might have a computer at home that you want to do work on, all right? Um, whether it be a laptop or a desktop or whatever. So therefore, it would be good for you to have Java installed on your particular machine, all right? Uh, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what it takes to install and the way Java is sort of works, all right? So sort of an overview of how Java applications work, all right? Um, and, and we'll get through that today through a mix of different things that we're going to talk about. Um, where do I want to start? Um, well, let's, let's, let's draw a diagram of what a, what a Java application looks like. First of all, you might think that you have Java installed. All right, people will say, I have Java installed. I know because I, I run Java applications or whatever. That's not necessarily the case. There's, there's actually two different pieces of Java that can be installed. And we'll, we'll want to make sure that we have actually both of them installed on your machines. The two pieces are the JRE and the JDK. JRE is Java Runtime. It's not, on the screen. it's not on the screen. Thank you. JRE is the Java Runtime Environment. This will allow you to run Java programs. All right? So if you know you might run a Java program for, for something or other. All right? 
That doesn't mean that you have the JDK installed. The JDK stands for Java Developers Kit. And this is what we need in this class to write Java programs. All right. Now, um, Java consists of one or more than one class files. All right. We'll talk about what a class is more in detail. Um, are any of you at least somewhat familiar with classes from your other programming courses? All right. Somewhat. Okay. We'll talk more about them. But there will be one or more than one class file. The source code for that is in a .java file. And this is a file that's human readable. In other words, you can look at it and read it. You can open it up in a text editor and see what it says and make sense of it. The name of the .java file, or the source file, will be whatever the name of the class is. Each class has a name associated with it, followed by .java. So class name dot java. All right. Now, here's how Java works. All right. One of the big benefits of Java is that it's what's called platform independent. In other words, it's not written just for Windows machines or Linux machines or Macs or whatever. It can run uh, across a lot of different platforms. So what happens is this Java source file gets compiled to one or more than one class file that ends in a dot class, where the first part of it is the class name. This process is called compiling. Now, in the simple examples we go over in the first part of class, there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between these. In other words, when you compile every .java file, will have one .class file associated with it. That's not always the case, all right? But the way we'll do it, at least to start, that's how it will work. Now, these are not in what is called machine code, all right? These are what is called Java bit code, or byte code, I'm sorry. These get executed by what's called the Java Virtual Machine. That's what takes the Java byte code and translate it into actual machine code. Machine code are the instructions that actually run on the chips, the processors that your program is running on. All right? So ultimately, that's the only language that computers understand is their machine code. Everything else sort of gets through, goes through a translation process. All right, well, one form or another. And this is how Java works. And this is how Java is platform dependent, because every platform will have its own Java virtual machine that can take it and translate the Java byte code, the compiled Java code, into the machine instructions that are needed to run. All right? So that's sort of going to be how this works. The Java Virtual Machine is part of the JRE. The ability to compile and all that is part of the JDK and to make those class files and so on. All right, let's see. Because of this little extra intermediary step, that's one reason that in the past, anyhow, um, Java had associated with it possibly some performance issues because there was sort of an intermediary step. Uh, I don't think that's really the case today. All right. How do I know if I have Java installed on my machine? There's, a, there's an easy way. All right. We're going to do stuff via command line in this class. 
How many of you have used the command line in classes? All right, a little bit. All right, you don't have to be an expert in it. You just need to know how to get to the command line and move around from directory to directory and uh, execute some commands. Now, you may wonder why I do this. I also uh, only use a, a plain text editor in Java. There are IDEs involved uh, in Java that, 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 that can be used to create Java code. But I use simply a plain text editor. And the reason for that is I want to really focus on the code. I don't want to focus on code that gets generated for you. I want to focus on writing the code ourselves and going through every step of the process and understanding it. It's possible later on in the semester, depending on how time goes, that we might look at an IDE. But right now, I'm really most interested that you get the, the code right and really understand it on a nuts and bolts level. All right? Um, so we're doing everything bare bones, like they might have done years ago, you know. Um, and again, I think by doing that, you really, really understand the language. So I'm going to go to the command line. And again, and Windows, you just type in CMD. Thank you. And you get to a command prompt where you can issue commands. And I'm going to make it bigger so that hopefully you can see it better. OK, not bad. How do you know if you have Java installed? Well, right off the bat, if you type in Java with nothing after it, one of two things will happen. It will either tell you command not recognized, or it will show you a long sort of help code. So let's see what happens here. I actually get help. It shows me, even though it's not terribly descriptive, it shows me different ways I can use the Java command. All right. So Java is installed on this machine. All right. So that's how you can test right off the bat if Java is installed or not. Go to the command prompt, type Java. Either you'll see it or you don't see it. What if it's not? What do you do? Well, let's see here. Under setting up your computer to do assignments, there is, uh, it refers to a page in the text. All right. You can also uh, Google installing Java and, and get specific platform help for your particular platform. Let's go and Google that. Installing JDK Windows. JDK installation for Microsoft Windows. Sort of the main things are you download the installation program, you run the install program, you update the path. That is a critical one. In fact, most of the time when people come to me with problems about their Java not working, it's because they forgot to upload or uh, update the path variable. And, and we'll talk about what you need to do to do that. All right? And then you can, you can use it. You should be able to go and, and create your Java classes and compile them and so on. All right, so. I would go and install JDK. Go to downloads from Oracle site. Um,
there's a JRE, which we do not want. Um, actually, Java SE um, is the one that you want. I was saying Java JDK. Um, looks like the JDK is part of the SE. It includes the JDK and it includes the JRE and so on. You would click and download the most recent one, the one that's relevant for your particular machine. All right, this looks like a good one. Or I click download and it will show me a whole list of them depending on what kind of machine I have. So if you had Mac or you had uh, Solaris or if you had Linux or Windows, you could download it and you could run it. It will ask you for several things. Note the directory that it installs stuff in because you'll need to know that directory later. Okay? So you'll go, you'll run through the installation process, you'll, you'll find the right version, you'll download the, the, the JDK, the ESC, and um, you will um, you will um, run it noting the directory. Next important thing to do is to set the path. Does anyone know what the path is on uh, a computer? Yes? It's where Windows looks for your programs. In other words, I might have Java, the Java program on my machine, but if my path isn't set, Windows won't be able to find it. So rather than searching your whole machine looking for a program called Java, all right, you tip off Windows by giving a path. And a path is what's called an environment variable. It sort of tells Windows some characteristics. And you can see your path by typing in path at the command line. And if you'll notice that, right at the beginning of the list is Java. So this one was set up correctly, all right? And this one says that you will find Java in this folder. C, Programs, Files, Java, JDK 1.8.0, underscore 92, slash bin. So we can go and actually find that folder. under C, under program files, under Java, under JDK, in bin, you will see the Java EXE. So the path says the folder where you can find the java.exe file. All right? So if you've installed it, you'll note that. If you take the defaults, it'll probably be program files, Java, JDK, whatever version you have, slash bin. All right? Now, how do you set the path? That's a darn good question. I'm going to see if I remember how to set the path. Because it varies from version of Windows to version of the Windows. First thing you do is you go to Control Panel. Which probably called settings now. Go to system. This is for Windows 10. Okay. Or you close all this and right button on this and go to control panel. Thank you. There we go. Now we go to system, advanced, ah, environment variables. There you go. Yes. Okay, cool. 
search for environment, it'll show up environment variables. It will then show you a list of your system environment variables, including path. So you can edit that. And then it really doesn't give you a lot of space to do stuff. But what you'd want to do is you'd want to paste that directory in, followed by a semicolon. So what I would do is I would go, if I had to do it, I would go to the folder that it's in, copy it, go to my environment variable, hit edit, go to the very beginning of this, paste it in, and then put a semicolon. All right. Most of the time, that's what goes wrong, is you either forget to do this step or you some, somehow do it incorrectly. All right, but that's what you'll need to do if you've installed the JDK and yet you still can't use Java. All right, I'm going to hit cancel because it was already set and I don't want to mess it up in case I type something wrong, and there you go. Then you should be able to go and run Java code. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the desktop. All right. When I open up the command prompt, it put me in my user directory. I'm user bu in here. So I'm going to get to the desktop. You can get to the desktop by typing in cd desktop. And there you are. You can clear the screen by typing in clear. I lied. CLS will clear the screen. All right. Um, I tend to, to not remember if it's a, a Unix command or a DOS command. So I, uh, uh, clear was a, a Unix command. So uh, pardon me if I ever get those wrong, because I do more command prompt on versions of Unix than I do on uh, Windows or DOS versions. All right, so now I'm on my desktop. How do I get a directory listing? DIR. We'll give it to you. All right. So if you can move from directory to directory and DIR and execute the Java commands, that's all the command line stuff you need to know. All right. Now, I'm going to go, and I have already made up here, I have the classic Hello World application. And I'm going to go, and I'm not going to type it in. I'm going to copy it. into a program, into a file. So I'm going to go copy. And I'm going to open up a simple text editor like Notepad++. And there's my stuff from earlier in the morning. Close that. I'm going to paste my code in here. All right. Now I'm going to save it on the desktop. All right. So I'm going to go up to File, Save, go up to the desktop. It is a Java source file, so I can pick Java source. If you're using regular old Notepad, you would have to go and change it to all files and then type file name .java, All right. if you don't have Notepad++. But it is a nice tool. You can, you can download it for free. And I'm going to give the name of the file as being the name of the class .java. Now, the name of the class is hello world. All right. Notice that the H in hello and the W in world is capitalized. All right. Windows is forgiving about case, but other operating systems aren't. So I would ask you, even if you are using Windows, to maintain the convention of case. So I'm going to save this in a file called hello world with the H and the W capitalized. All right. As a convention, class names start with a capital letter, and then each subsequent word is also capitalized. So if it was called hello world, class, the H and the W are canceled, or, or, or not canceled, capitalized, all right? If I wanted to say uh, 
if I had a student information class, the S in student and the I in information would be capitalized. Uh, automobile rental agreement. The A in automobile, the R in rental, and the A in agreement would be capitalized. That's by convention. Um, it's not an absolute rule of the language, but it is good practice to sort of follow the conventions. It really makes your code more readable and makes it easier for other folks to understand it. So I'm saving it in a file called hello world.java. All right. So it's saved on the desktop. I'm going to clear my screen. And I'm going to compile it now. Right now, if I do a listing of hello world, there is the one file, hello world.java, and this other file that, that really is not important. All right? So let me do that. D I R H E asterisk. Shows me I have that one file, the Java file. I'm going to compile now, and you compile by typing in Java and the name of the class that you want to compile. We'll talk about what happens if you have multiple classes later. But right now, we're only going to have one class, so I'm just going to type the name of the class, hello world.java. My bad. I don't type in Java. I type Java C. It is going through the compile process. If it doesn't display anything, no news is good news. That means that it compiled it without any errors. So my mistake. It's not Java to compile. It's Java C. It's been a long summer. All right. Now if we look at this, we're going to have two files. We're going to have the hello world.java, which is the human readable one, and we're going to have the hello world class file, which is com compiled into uh, the Java bytecode. We can try to look at it if we want. but it's not really very human readable. All kinds of special characters and so on. So, all right. So we compiled it. Now it's ready to be run. So if you write your Java class, it's not ready to run. You first have to compile it. How do you run it? That's how you type in Java, when you type in Java, and then the name of the class. Again. We'll talk about what you do when you have more than one class later on, because most of your Java programs consist of multiple class files, not just one. But this week, I think, uh, the examples that we're going over all are just a single class file. So there's no question about what you compile and what you do. So if I type in Java Hello World, it goes and does its thing, which is simply dis to display Hello World. All right, not earth shattering. What happens if you make a mistake? I'm going to go just for laughs and make a mistake. I'm going to change that lowercase o to a capital O. All right. And I'm going to try to compile it again, and we'll see what it says. Java is case sensitive. Um, again, except Windows, which forgives you on case for file names, but nowhere else. So you might as well be case sensitive everywhere. So I made a mistake. I changed that lowercase o to an uppercase o, and I'm going to compile. Here's a neat trick if you haven't done much command line stuff. If you use the up arrow, you can scroll backwards through your commands. So like if you're working on a program, you don't have to type in that long Java C every time. You can just scroll back up and run it. And it gives me an error. And it sort of tells me where the error is. It doesn't give me as clear of a description as I'd want it to do, but hey, it's a machine, right? So you got to do some of the work. So it tells me that there's an error in this line in Hello World Java, line 24. 
That's one thing that's good about Notepad++ is it gives you the line number. So line 24. And it tells me that something is wrong whoops, around this period. All right, that's where things start to go bad. And it tells me there's something wrong with out, O-U-T. Well, could be misspelling, could be whatever. In this case, I know what the problem is. I know that I capitalize it when I shouldn't. So I can say, oh, OK, that shouldn't be uppercase. It should be lowercase. I can go save it, compile it again, and run it again. Whoops. And there you go. When you run it, you don't have to put hello world.class or hello world.java, just the name of the class. Okay. Now, let's look at this class, and we'll talk about it for the remainder of class today. Uh, and we will, um, um, you won't know enough to do your homework at this point. Your homework isn't due until next Wednesday, though, so that's good. Um, but we will uh, on uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday, talk about um, what you need to do to complete your first homework assignment. It's just really sort of a variation of this. So let's look at this class, uh, at this file. First of all, there are certain things that are comments in this file. And if you've done C sharp, the convention is uh, the same as, as near as I know. I don't think there's any differences. If you see two slashes at the beginning, or really anywhere in the line, the rest of the line is considered to be a comment. What's a comment is an explanation of what the program does. Why do you do that? Well, to help other people that are going to change your program, or to even help yourself when you go and look at your program a month from now, and you don't remember exactly what it was supposed to do. So the slash slash is a comment. You'll notice here. And here, we have a set of lines that start with a slash star and end with a, with a star slash. That's a block of multiple line comments. So I could have put a slash slash in front of all of them, but this person decided it was easier to put a slash star than a star slash at the end. So I could have had slash 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 all the way down the end. So that's comments. The compiler ignores those completely. These are just meant for you. Because remember, a big consideration in any program that you write is not just getting the right answer, but writing code that's maintainable. And putting comments in your code is one way to make your code more maintainable. All right, now to the fun stuff. All right, our class file, the actual Java code, consists of lines 20 through 27. Again, 23 being a comment. And it starts off with public. Public class hello world. All right? All of your code is going to be in one or another class. You don't have any code in Java that's not in a class. All right? Um, with a couple exceptions we'll talk about later. But your code is going to be within a class. What is a class? It's, it's a chunk of code. And we'll give a more meaningful definition of it later on. But it's, it's a block of code that you're going to run as a unit. Public means that the outside world can use this class. Initially, all our classes are going to be public, because why would we write something if we didn't want to have access to it? There's occasions for that, but initially, when we have very simple projects, all our classes are going to be public. So we say it's public, we say it's a class, then we give the name of the class. The name of the class, again, should follow the convention that I mentioned. Each word, including the first, is capitalized. All right, And it should be in a file that is exactly this, .java, All right, which it is. Hello world.java, hello world. 
We then have a starting brace and an ending brace. These braces can be confusing at times. This is where it's important to line up your code so that you can really see what brace belongs to each other. This is also a nice feature of Notepad++, because if I put my mouse behind this brace, it makes it red. It makes its partner also red. So you can easily see what two things go together. But a brace is used to contain, for containment, for blocking things, for putting things together. And in this case, everything between this brace and this brace is part of this public class. OK? This class contains one method. All right? A method and function are synonymous. All right? It also is a public method, which means the outside world can use it. Static, we're not going to talk about right now. All right? Void is what the function returns. And in this case, this function doesn't return anything, so it's void. Then we have the name of the function, and then we have the name of any arguments that can be passed to the function. Now, this is important. Every Java application you write will have at least one class that has a method called main, which is a public, static, void method called main, which accepts a string array of arguments. Every, every Java application we write will have at least one class that has this in it. That's sort of the driver class, the sort of the class that sort of runs things. All right, there may be code in other classes that the, that, the, that the boss uses to get the job done, but this is sort of the main class, the main driver class. Public means the outside world can see it. Static, we're not going to talk about. Void means it doesn't return a value, doesn't return anything. Main is the name of the function, and these are our arguments that this can be passed, which we're not going to worry about right now. So the function starts here and ends here. Again, notice how nice this is indented, so I can tell at a glance that those belong together. In addition, Notepad++ shows me. It consists of one line of code, which simply outputs to the console, hello world. How do you output something? System, system is capitalized, dot out, dot print ln, and then you have what you want to output. And if what you want to output is a string, just a hard-coded string that says hello world or whatever, you would enclose that in quotation marks. Notice that each statement ends with a semicolon. All right? So we have our statement that goes and outputs that, and there you go. That's all that this does. All right. We are out of time. Next time, I'll we'll review about this. Then we'll start playing with this to make it do some other stuff, to do more exciting stuff than just saying, hello, world. All right. Uh, we'll see you up in lab.